The series that we started a few weeks ago in the book of Acts, uh, we're calling Living Proof, and what we're seeing, uh, we're seeing how Jesus' life in the Spirit uh, was living through the first century believers in their day, so much so uh, that later on in Acts it says that they turned their world upside down. And the reason we're going through that is because we want to turn our world right side up for Jesus Christ. And we're hoping to discover some things about these men and women uh, that will be helpful in us in making some readjustments so we're right where we ought to be. Now, uh, at this point in our, our journey, Acts chapter 2, what's happened before is the uh, disciples have obeyed Jesus and they remained in Jerusalem. That's what he said, don't go anywhere. And they were waiting. And we found out last week that while they're waiting, they were staying together in fellowship. Uh, they were praying together on a regular basis in that upper room. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they were following the spiritual leadership that God had risen up in the apostle Peter and the other apostles. We also saw last week that they took care of the gap uh, that existed on their apostolic team uh, by selecting and choosing Matthias to be, quote, the 12th man. And so the only thing left, the only thing left uh, is the arrival of the one that Jesus promised would come, the Holy Spirit. He said uh, to the apostles, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. But they're to wait, and this morning we're in that place where the waiting uh, comes to an end as they receive, uh, here in chapter 2, the power of the Spirit that Jesus promised was going to make them effective witnesses. Now, if you haven't been with us uh, this year, our focus this year, Vision 2014, is that as a church we would more intentionally reach out uh, to people who don't yet uh, know the Lord. And this morning, uh, Royce Morgan's going to come right now. He's a member of a small group that, out in the Bonnie Lake area. And I heard that their group just recently started talking about how they could apply Vision 2014 as a group. And I asked Royce to come and, and share a little bit about that discussion you guys had and decisions that you made. Thanks, brother. We were talking about in our small group um, whether or not uh, first-time visitors and newcomers uh, felt connected and uh, felt welcome. And uh, one of the ladies in our group shared a story uh, where she was new in a town and went to a church for the first time. And um, at the end of the service, the pastor, one of the pastors came up to her and said, uh, has anyone asked you to lunch yet? And she said, well, no. And so he made sure that he got her connected with a group of, a small group of people that took her to lunch that day. And uh, one of the people in our group said, you know, I wish our church had a ministry like that. And uh, someone else said, well, why can't we do it? And so we feel like we're being led to once a month to uh, invite newcomers, visitors over to one of our houses and uh, uh, serve them lunch. That's awesome. So any of you that are visiting with the first, first time, this is the guy's face you want to <laughs> get to know. Thank you so much, brother. Let's, let's encourage him this morning. I met this morning three people uh, throughout the morning that are here uh, for the very first time, and we love uh, having new people uh, join us. I also want to mention a book that's in the library. I was supposed to mention a few weeks ago, but, you know, the, the mind doesn't work as it used to. It's called Master Plan of Discipleship by Roger, uh, Robert Coleman. Uh, Master Plan of Evangelism, his first volume, traveled with Jesus and the 12 apostles and really gives an insight on he, how he got them ready for the mission. Uh, Master Plan of Discipleship takes it through the book of Acts. And so it's a great companion reading uh, to our study on Sundays and in your small groups. A few copies in the library, Master Plan of Discipleship by Dr. Robert Coleman. Now, this morning we're going to look at, at the coming of the Holy Spirit. And, and we're going to see that, the first of all, the coming of the Holy Spirit means that believers are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, that he lives in their life. We're going to see that, that um, when the Holy Spirit comes, believers don't speak uh, as they used to. They speak uh, differently. The message has changed. And 
when the Holy Spirit comes, we're going to see that people that don't know Christ, they hear the message and they respond. All of those come right out of the text that we're looking at in Acts chapter 2. Uh, so let's, if you're not there, turn there. Believers, let's look at the first one. Believers in Jesus would be indwelt. Uh, the Holy Spirit would live within them. Verse 1. <clears throat> when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And one of the uh, words that doesn't get translated in, in the NIV uh, would cause this sentence to read, and they began to speak loudly and clearly in other tongues as the Spirit uh, enabled them. Now the Feast of Pentecost, it came 50 days after the Passover feast. In the lives of these 10, it came 10 days after Jesus had gone back to heaven. Pentecost was a feast where the people would come with the first fruits of their harvest and they would bring them in and they would thank God and they would celebrate uh, what he'd done and it was also a way for them to say and now God the harvest is still going and we're going to trust you not only for the first fruits we're also going to trust you for what comes in at the end of a harvest hoping for bounty but uh, a highly agricultural community at the time was very dependent and understood that what took place came from God. What also happened in later Judaism leading up to this time is they began to also celebrate at the Pentecost, at Pentecost, the giving of the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses uh, so long ago on Mount Sinai. So it's fascinating. Uh, so Pentecost for them up to this point <clears throat> meant those two things. When God gave the law to Moses, uh, one of the things that the law proved is that people couldn't keep it. They could not obey it perfectly. Uh, and because of the law, they fell out of freedom and into bondage. The Holy Spirit comes, uh, who brings freedom and the ability to live life very differently. It is no coincidence uh, that the Holy Spirit is sent at this time when normally they would be celebrating the giving of the law, and now they're gonna, it's remembered for something uh, very, very different. It says that they were all together, probably in the room, that upper room in the city of Jerusalem uh, that we saw in Acts chapter 1, verse 13. All of the apostles are there. Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the other women are there. Uh, all of Jesus' half-brothers are located there. We're told that there's approximately 120 uh, people. So this is a, this is a large upper room. And, and Luke tells us that they're sitting on the floor. <clears throat> you say, well, you know, what's the big deal about that? In Acts chapter 1, where we see them praying together, the physical uh, body for at that time, if you were praying, you were either on your knees or you were standing uh, tall. And if you were sitting, that would have been the most common physical position uh, to be in if you were being taught. So some think maybe Peter was uh, exercising his apostolic uh, authority and teaching ability and teaching during this time. Others think that they were all sitting down because God sat them down because of a soon arrival of the great teacher in the person of the Spirit of God. Now it says, Luke tells us that the Spirit came with the sound of a violent wind blowing throughout the room. Now picture this, you're sitting on the ground and you don't feel the wind. It doesn't say that they were being thrown all over the room. It says they heard the sound of what seemed like a violent blowing wind. So what I'd like you to do right now is just, just kind of close your eyes. Picture yourself as one of the 120 in the upper room. You're just sitting there minding your own business.
So you're in the room that day, you're sitting on the floor and you hear this. What might they have done? Run out of there as fast as you can. Jesus did not tell them a violent wind will come at the time of the Spirit. So if you're hearing that, run is the other. The other is maybe you're paralyzed and you can't move. Uh, but that's what it was like that day according to Dr. Luke. And it said the Spirit also came, not just like that, but with fire that apparently came as in, in a mass, if you will, because it says then it separated out uh, into smaller uh, units of fire that rested upon everyone that was in the room. And some of you have probably seen that. There's so many paintings of all of the apostles and the others that were in the room at Pentecost, and you get a, a little a tongue of fire on the top of their heads. We don't know exactly what it was, but we know it separated and it rested on everybody that was in the room. And you might ask, okay, why a violent wind? Why fire? Good question, thank you for asking. As evidence to those who were in the room and to their physical senses that Jesus' promise was being fulfilled at that time time. It didn't have to come like this. Uh, it's not how the Holy Spirit has come into, I would guess, most of our lives. But this is not a prescriptive uh, part of Scripture saying this is how he'll always, always come. Luke, it's a descriptive part of Scripture that you often get in the book of Acts that is simply describing what took place in that room. Now the significance of the wind is uh, important. Jesus described the Holy Spirit in John 3 like the wind, that he goes wherever he wants and he blows wherever he wants and you can't see him and yet you know with the wind you can see branches move and leaves move so you see that he's bare, there by that and Jesus says that, that as he's coming here he's bearing witness to your sense of sound that he's here. The significance of fire, fire mostly in the Old Testament, but referred to in the New Testament, uh, represents the presence and the holiness and the purification uh, process that God works in us and who he is. The visual evidence for the apostles in that room would have been clear evidence of God's presence and the coming of the Holy Spirit. It was, it was John the Baptist that said, hey, I baptize with water, but boy, there's someone coming who's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and in fire. Jesus told the apostles and others, you'd be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That he was going to live in you. It was going to be a whole new economy and relationship that the Spirit of God was going to have with human beings. In the past, in the Old Testament in particular, the Holy Spirit, we read, would come upon men and women uh, who had to speak an important word or accomplish an important task, and then he would leave. It wasn't 24-7. It was accomplish this and then gone. Jesus makes it clear, and the New Testament makes it clear, that the Holy Spirit's relationship to people who believe, to human beings, is going to be different in this new economy than it ever had been before. He will be in you, and he will never leave you or never uh, forsake you. And so if you're here this morning and you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've trusted him, the Spirit of God uh, is in you uh, in the same way, in the same way. It's the same Spirit that was in uh, these at that time. Now Luke tells us <clears throat> that they were filled up uh, with the Holy Spirit. Uh, the idea in the New Testament especially, is that they were controlled and empowered. In other words, if I was pouring water into a glass and I poured it up so that there was no part of the glass that was empty anymore, it was all filled up. That's kind of the idea. And the Holy Spirit of God wants to fill up the life of everyone, but especially those who believe, uh, with himself so that we will live like Jesus on the planet. We'll talk like him, we'll think like him, we'll do what he would do, we'll use our spiritual gifts and all of those kinds of things. Now, as we go through Acts, you're going to see certain times where it says, and Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, and Paul filled with the Holy Spirit, 
and Barnabas filled with the Holy Spirit at various times in their ministry when God filled them up to overflowing for the work that he had. Spirit was there, but he became the power source for what they did. Now, when it talks about them being filled in the Spirit, it's in the passive voice, which simply means the apostles didn't fill themselves. The women didn't fill themselves. You don't fill yourself. The filling of the Holy Spirit comes from the outside in, not from the inside in. And what we have described here is God sending his spirit from heaven who filled. They could ask for the filling all they want, but God had to send him from heaven. And that's what we see taking place. Uh, later on, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5.18 would give a command to believers. Be filled with the spirit. The idea is keep being filled up. Uh, with the Spirit of God. Keep surrendering, keep relinquishing, ple keep giving Him uh, the controls, the driver's seat, you know, the song, Jesus Take the Wheel. Keep allowing uh, the Spirit of God to be the one who makes you the person God wants. And so the question that I just kind of uh, roll out to you to think about is, have you believed? If you're here with us this morning, and if, if you hear me, you are here, right? Unless you, you've gone somewhere since we began. Thank you in the front. Uh, have you believed in Jesus? If so, the same Spirit dwells within your life and desires to fill, control, and empower you. But the bigger question is, he's already decided that's how he wants to work. The bigger question is, do you want him to work that way? Do you want him to control and empower and direct. Do you want him to be the decision maker? Do you want him to give you power from heaven? Apparently the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. We can grieve him and we can quench him. He will not make his way into my heart and life unless there is surrender by faith. And it's always been that. It was that way for Peter and Paul and all the guys. And it's that way for you and I this morning. Have you been giving him leadership position? If not, this is a wonderful morning to do that. The coming of the Holy Spirit means that he will live within our lives like never before. Also means that believers in Jesus would speak like never before. Acts 2 verse 4 says, All of them in the room were filled with the Holy Spirit, everyone and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And so the first activity given by the Spirit to those filled up believers was to engage their mouth, to activate their tongue, to fill them with words and content based on His leadership and direction from within. It says that they spoke in other tongues. We'll see in a minute why that was so important, but literally other languages than their own in the dialect and even the accent, if you will, of those that were in Jerusalem at that time. They spoke in languages that they had never learned or ever spoken before. This was a spirit-initiated ability. It was from heaven, not earth. In John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, Jesus told the apostles, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will testify about me. And he says, and you also will testify or witness about me. And the very first thing that we see when the Holy Spirit comes upon their life is the Spirit begins to testify about the Son of God, and the disciples, the apostles, begin to testify about the Son of God. The very thing that Jesus said would take place when the Spirit of God came. And that's exactly what happened. You see, all of us, all of us, every single one of us in this room and in the last 2,000 years that have believed in Jesus and received His Spirit should speak like we've never done before. Not as it relates to learning, speaking a language that you haven't learned, but as it relates to the gospel of the kingdom. 
The Apostle Paul says, we speak spiritual truth. Those of us that have the Spirit. We speak spiritual truth to those that have the Spirit. We speak words that have to be spiritually discerned or understand. And when you believe in Jesus and the Spirit of God comes on you, He changes the way you speak. He changes what comes out of your mouth. You begin to testify about the Son of God, and sometimes you're slapping yourself saying, I don't know enough to do that, but you can't help yourself. Remember back to that time when you first believed. In the early days for most of us, if we understood a little bit, we began to tell our friends, and they said, you idiot. I remember my friend and me, Steve, said in the back of a car one night, he says, oh, this is just the latest thing. Uh, it'll grow old in six months. You'll give it up and be right back with the rest of us. And I didn't know enough at that time. Oh, well, six months of this isn't bad. That, that's okay. It's been 35 years. But so many of us, the first activity is that we start talking about what's going on in our life. Unfortunately, that activity lessens over time. Not because it's biblical to do that, but because we stop allowing him to empower us to say the things that we're supposed to say. It's happened to me. I bet it's happened to you. And we're at a time in the church, in our church, where God is calling us back to first things. Where he's getting us back to where we were in our first love. And when you were in your first love of Jesus Christ, you were telling people in your own way about what he was doing in your life, whether they liked you afterwards or not. And that's what the church of Jesus Christ is always meant to do. That's how it advances, okay, in that day and in our day. And so it's not about the language. I mean, that's really cool. That's really awesome. You'll see why in a minute. But bigger was the truth that was coming out of their mouth which is referred to as the wonders of God. That's why I like Bill Bright's statement, successful witnessing. The way I learned it is this, successful witnessing is taking the initiative to share Jesus Christ. I mean, I have to get off my duff. Taking the initiative to share Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit and then leaving the results to God. I can't make anybody a Christian. I can only share what I know in the power of the Spirit, speaking spiritual truth with spiritual words, and then he does whatever he does. And then finally, the coming of the Holy Spirit means people will hear and respond to the gospel. They'll respond to the good news. They'll respond to the witness. How will they respond? It can be in a lot of different ways. Verse 5, now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound... A crowd came together in bewilderment. Why? Because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? And here's who was in Jerusalem. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia... Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, all the way from Rome, wow, 1,440 miles, I just came to my head, I think that's right, uh, both Jews, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, I wouldn't want that name, and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, and then Luke says, amazed and perplexed. They looked to one another and said, uh, what does this mean? And then some others, however, made fun of them. That ever happened to you? Oh, you're Jesus. He's just a crutch. Oh, don't ever talk to me. You wimp. Can't you live life without a crutch? Yeah, eh, I've had that. I've had that. Some said they've had too much wine. And this was at 9 a.m. in the morning, and Peter will address that next week when we look at it. And so... People staying in Jerusalem, who either lived there or, there or there for Pentecost, heard this sound. They probably heard this violent wind, which captured their attention. And they heard this speaking, uh, bold, loud speaking in their native tongues, and apparently rushed to the place where this was happening. If they were in the upper room, if that's indeed the location, they're there looking up, you know, or trying to get up there. Who's in Jerusalem at that time? It was a group of people um, 
that were God-fearing Jews or, or and converts to Judaism, Greeks who came to believe in the one true God, who were in Jerusalem for the feast. Uh, some were visiting, it makes it very clear by using that word, from other places, and most commentators believe that many of these people, if not most, lived in the city or lived back in Palestine. That during the, the post-exilic time, they dispersed out of Jerusalem and went everywhere. They went down into Africa, they went through Asia Minor, even they say there were some uh, Jewish settlements in Rome, but they believe by this time many uh, of those who had moved away had come back and were living uh, in the area again. So if that's true, then most in the crowd uh, that day uh, would most likely both speak and understand languages that were common in Jerusalem and in Palestine, which would have been Aramaic, a form of Hebrew and Greek. And yet that isn't what they're hearing. Instead, they're hearing these Galileans speaking in the very language and the dialect of the locations they were from in Africa, in Libya, in Rome, in Phrygia, in Asia Minor, in Macedonia. They heard these Galileans speaking in this language. Way, which made what they were hearing even more spectacular and amazing and perplexing and confusing and uh, chaotic for the people there. They refer to these people speaking as Galileans. And you say, oh, was that a term of endearment? Absolutely not. Referring to them as Galileans was talking down their noses to them making fun of the region that they came from and how unsophisticated and unintelligent they were. In fact, the Galileans, when they tried to uh, put together various syllables in their own language, they, they would make these funny sounds that they were often ridiculed uh, by how, how they talked. And here they were speaking what we're told were the amazing wonders of God in languages that they'd never learned but that matched the backgrounds and the places and the locations where people in Jerusalem or people in Jerusalem had come from. You say, what were the wonders of God they spoke about? Well, they certainly could have spoke about all of the wonders of God from the Old Testament. The parting of the, uh, the Red Sea. Uh, God's leadership in the wilderness when they didn't have, when Mos under Moses' leadership. Uh, they could have talked about a number of things that God did in the Old Testament. The wonders and the work of God. Maybe they begin to talk about the Messiah. Maybe they begin to describe that, that this one that was put to death is alive today, and we're witnesses of that. Maybe they begin to communicate some of what Jesus had taught them. In Peter's message next week, I believe that, the, that much of the content that you see in Peter's first sermon probably represented the wonders of God uh, that were coming out of their mouth that particular day. And then they very nicely went into sermon form so the people could hear it and so that we could have it uh, even today. It says upon hearing it, the people there were bewildered, utterly amazed, perplexed. And they had a couple of different responses. Some responded by asking a really important question. It says they looked at one another when they heard these sounds and these Galileans speaking, and they said, what does this mean? They didn't say, be quiet, you idiots. They said, what? And they looked at one another. What does this mean? It reminded me of almost 37 years ago sitting on the grass uh, front lawn of a house of someone who had become a Christian a couple of months earlier. And I remember as we sat there, she was explaining to me and attempting to explain to me who Jesus was, what had happened in her life, that he was alive, and all the things of the gospel. And I remember as she was speaking to me, it was almost as though, you know, I, I only speak and understand English. It was like she was speaking in some native tongue. She was speaking English, but I, I didn't have the ability to spiritually discern what she was saying. But I remember, <clears throat> I remember my attitude 
that day, it was a similar thing. What does this mean? I had made fun of her earlier. I had ridiculed her earlier. But on this day, the thing inside of me was, what does this mean? That was the beginning of me giving credence to the gospel that she was presenting. These guys, many of them, what does this mean? The other group, they just make a wrong assumption. They say, oh, uh, the reason that they're able to talk like this is uh, they've had too much wine. It's 9 o'clock in the morning, and they partied all night, and they're drunk, and that's why they can talk in languages that they've never learned. Um, that's not how people that get wasted talk. They don't all of a sudden talk in languages they haven't learned. They do begin to talk in languages we've never heard, but you know, you know what I mean. So, but, but that's anyway, that's what some were saying. And whenever the gospel goes forth, whenever the wonders of God are spoken of, people are going to respond in a variety of ways based on where they're at. Again, this is why successful witnessing is taking the initiative to share Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and then leaving the results uh, to God. And so when the Spirit came this day, uh, he, it means that he was going to live in them and in any who believed in Jesus in a way like he never had before. Um, when the Spirit came like this, it means that, that believers then, in a very unique and unusual way, and believers now are going to speak in a way like they never have before about the things of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's going to change, if you will, the words that come out of our mouth. And then finally, we know that when the Spirit comes uh, and, and people that hear uh, are going to respond in some way. Now, let me ask you, if you're here, as we kind of uh, hit towards the close here, uh, do, you, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe he died on a cross for you because you have a sin problem like everybody else in the human race? He was buried, he rose again, he's coming again, he sent his spirit. Do you believe not just that he's a really good guy, but he is the Messiah, your Messiah? Have you received his Holy Spirit? Does the Spirit of the living God, the one promised uh, by Jesus, the one uh, who arrived in the story today, have you received him? Does he live in your life? Do you let him empower and control you? Are you, question number three, are you therefore speaking out for him in your neighborhood, in the workplace, as you meet people? In other words, has the Holy Spirit who lives within you that we're told would give us power to witness, are you experiencing his power in your witness? Are you experiencing his power in your testimony? Are you finding that you're saying things that you don't even know where they quite came from, but they fit the moment that you're in with people's life? That is what it means. He will give you power to witness, to testify, to tell what you know. Are you telling people what you know about Jesus? If you are, I just want you to know, that's the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through you. If you are not, then the opposite of that would be that I'm quenching and grieving the Holy Spirit. We don't all tell our story the same. We don't, we don't share Jesus the same. We're all very unique in this room. But if nothing's going on in that area, when the Spirit of God came to do that very thing, you have to look in the mirror, as do I, and say, what in the world is going on? This is a very big deal for the church of Jesus Christ then and for the church of Jesus Christ now. Now, Jesus said, apostles that have been trained by me, the most well-trained group on the planet, don't go anywhere until the Spirit comes. Now, that's amazing to the best. Trained by the Son of God. That's a pretty good training camp. But don't go anywhere until he comes. Because if you go anywhere, even with your good training, even though you know a lot now, you're going to fall right on your face. Spirit comes, boom, they turn the world upside down. No different today. No different today. Jesus would tell his church today, do not try to do the mission, unless you're willing to let the Spirit of God in you testify through you about who I am. One of the things that I've heard for many, many years, even embraced it myself at one time, don't right now, people would say, um, I'm building, what I'm doing in sharing my faith is I'm building relational bridges 
with lost people so that I can earn the right to share Christ with them. I'm building relational bridges so that I can earn the right to share Christ with him. Let me, let me cut that apart in two ways. First of all, it is absolutely essential that Christians have friends that aren't. There is no way we're going to reach people if we stay away from the people who are meant to be reached. I'm so glad that I had three friends that hung out with a pretty miserable little guy back in Stockton, California because they cared about me. Really glad, you know, for those three. So, so, so that I get that. It's the other part. So that I can earn the right to share Christ. You can't earn the right. You don't have the authority within you to give yourself the right. Nobody around you that you're sharing with can give you the right. The right to share Jesus Christ was earned on a wooden cross 2,000 years ago. It was costly, it was painful, it was ugly, it was brutal. And when Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished, that he gave everyone who believed in him the right to become children of God and the authority and the power to testify about him. You already have the authority. You already have the right. You don't give it to yourself. Your neighbor doesn't give it to you. You own it. If you are in Christ and the Spirit is in you, then you have the authority to be his ambassador, to testify about him, to tell people, to do whatever the Spirit of God leads you to do. You have everything that you need, and so do I. The question is always about submitting to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, who Jesus says, he will testify about me, and you also will testify about me. And so the Spirit is a willing witness, a w w always willing to talk about Jesus and tell people about Jesus and love people for Jesus and all of that stuff. Some of us have built relational bridges that would allow a 20-ton truck to travel across all day long. The problem, he wants you to walk across it. He wants me to walk across it. And by the looks of us, we all weigh a whole lot less than that 20-ton truck. The challenge this morning for me, and baby, it is on me, is will we allow the Spirit of the living God to cause us to share the greatest news on the planet whether we're made fun of, whether people are offended, whether someone says, I don't believe that there's only one. It doesn't matter. Will we testify or will we not? Will we tell what we know or not? If you go to court and you say, I know something, but I'm not going to testify, they'll hold you in contempt. I wonder how many of us would be held in contempt because we know something and we don't tell anybody about it, including me. I don't know the answer to that. So here's what I would ask you and I to consider and think about. Will you walk across bridges with the good news of Jesus Christ? Will you walk across some of those bridges this week? Will you trust him? Will you go in his power? Why did the disciples except one die? Because they wouldn't stop witnessing about Jesus Christ. Well, first of all, they were obedient to the Spirit of God in them that said, tell others. So that was one. The other was urgent. They thought Jesus was going to return. It was imminent. He could come back any hour. And we don't have a minute to wait. The problem is it's been 2,000 years. And now we think we've got years to wait. Decades to wait. Millennial to wait. We need to live as though this is it. No more days beyond today. No more afternoon beyond this afternoon. Then we will be living like the apostles did. He's coming soon. He is coming very soon. 
2,000 years sooner than he was when they were going crazy with the gospel. So, I know what the Lord's been speaking to me about, and it's probably pretty evident. I know that he's calling our church. I know he's calling our church to be different. I know he, he's calling our church to be a church that becomes known at its very core as a house of prayer. We're not there yet. We're making headway. Two corrections that I believe Jesus Christ would make to his church in North America. You don't have to, you don't have to agree with me on that. You can disagree. It doesn't matter. Um, first of all, I think he'd say the church in North America is not a praying church. When the average Christian prays five minutes a day and the average pastor prays seven, that's not a praying church. Let's just, let's just we're not a praying church. Let's just admit it. The other thing is you're not a proclaiming church. Church in the United States does not pray and it does not proclaim. Because the culture says, uh, be tolerant, don't be offensive, being nice is what really matters. You will not win anybody to Christ by niceness. The gospel is offensive. It cuts across. It doesn't make people happy. But it's the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first and then to the Greek. If we don't proclaim it, if all you do is good deeds in your life, you're no different than every other religious person on the planet. What distinguishes you from a Mormon? Or a Jehovah Witness? Or a Muslim? or a whatever, if you just do good things. Unless you testify about the Savior, you are right in the same boat with every other religion, and so am I, based on good works. What separates us from everyone is the one we follow. And if we will not proclaim Him, then we will answer one day for our silence. I know we will. I know I will. So please... Hear what the Lord is saying to his church. I am simply the vehicle. I am simply the messenger. I'm as convicted, if not more, than any of you. These are not easy. We only live one time. We only have one shot at this. And for the believer in Jesus Christ, testifying about the Savior, Jesus said, would be the first thing that happens when the Holy Spirit comes. And we saw it today, and many of us have seen it in our background. The question is, will we see it tomorrow? And will we see it on Wednesday? Father, thanks for giving us the comforter, the helper, the one who takes feeble little lives like ours and turns them upside down for the glory of God and for the reputation of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, we sang that song today. We need you to fall down. We, Lord, there's patterns in my life, there's patterns in our life that need to be uprooted, that need to be dug out, and, or, or we're just going to settle back in. I know myself. I will settle back in to same old, same old. So God, would you be so kind to this church in digging out traditions and digging out uh, places where our love has gone cold and digging out some kind of belief that somehow we don't have the right or the authority to testify about the one who lives within us. How crazy is that? And that's where we find ourselves. Some of us do today. And so take the words that have been spoken and the ones that are from you, apply deeply. The ones that aren't, hit delete and cause us to be a church that becomes a praying church, a house of prayer for the nations and a proclaiming church so that you can add to your church daily those who are being saved. We pray all of this in the name of our matchless Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Drive safely home, okay, and have a nice warm afternoon.